Hi, in this video we will talk about a spam filtering task. Let's, let me remind you that when we, uh, when, we, when we want to use bag of words representation, we actually need, for every n-gram of our text, we actually need to find the feature index or the index of column where we will input the value, let's say tf-idf values, uh, into. And for that purpose, we need to maintain that correspondence uh, from ngram to feature index. And usually you use a hash map or a dictionary in Python for that. But let's assume that your dataset is huge, and that's where it can become a problem. Let's say we have one terabyte of text which are distributed on 10 computers. And you need to vectorize each text. You need to replace the text with a vector of tf-idf values. You will actually have to maintain that correspondence from ngram to feature index, and uh, that, be that can become a problem when you have 10 computers that are doing the same thing. Because the first problem is that that uh, hash map can actually not fit in memory on one machine. So that means that you need a kind of a database when you store, where you store these correspondence and all machines use that database. That doesn't scale well. And another problem is that it is difficult to synchronize that uh, uh, hash map because when new ngram appears, you have to take, you have to introduce a new index for it. And uh, 10 machines are doing that in parallel, which means that they should uh, synchronize somehow. They should say that, okay, uh, let's say I'm machine number one, I found a new ngram, and I'm taking the next uh, free index in our uh, hash map, and I add that correspondence to the hash map. But that uh, particular ngram should be converted to that feature index on all other machines as well. So all other machines should somehow know that that first machine introduced a new feature index. So that can become a problem and that can uh, uh, actually uh, lead to bad scaling of that uh, uh, workload. And there is an easier way actually. You can uh, uh, throw away hash map and you can just replace it with hashing. And that means that you take ngram, you take a hash value of that ngram and take that value modulo 2 to the 20 or 2 to the 22 or any other huge number. Um, you, uh, the hash is actually a function that, um, that converts an input into some number. So you can give it different strings and it will output you different uh, numbers. But for some strings, they can sometimes output the same value and that is known as collision. And hash functions have collisions, but in practice we will later see that if you take it if you take that hash value modulo 2 to the high, uh, you rise it to the high power, then uh, those collisions can be neglected. You can uh, actually that hashing vectorizer is implemented in scikit-learn and it's called hashing vectorizer obviously and it's also implemented in Vopal Webit library that we will later overview. Okay, so let's take spam filtering task. And as you might guess, that is a huge task because even if you're a medium mail server, people send a lot of emails. And if you have millions of users, then you have a terabyte of text that you need to analyze. There is actually uh, a paper on, Ar on Archive and uh, it actually introduces proprietary data set for spam filtering. It has half a million users, three million letters, and it has 40 million unique words that are seen in that letters. Let's say we map each token to index using some hash function phi. It works like the following. It takes our token x, uh, it hashes it, and takes that value modulo 2 to the b. And for b equally 22, we have 4 million features. And that is actually a huge improvement over 40 million features that we originally had. So we ha somehow mapped our 40 million features into 4 million features. And thanks to the fact that hash collisions are very unlikely, uh, they are there, but there are not a lot of them, uh, we can actually train the model on top of that 4 million features and still get the same pretty decent result. So, let's look at the example of how that hashing vectorizer works. And first, let me introduce some hash function for uh, an arbitrary string. We have a string s. We take the first 
character code of that string, and uh, that is actually a number from 0 to 255, for example. And then you, next, you take the next character, you multiply it by some fixed prime number, then you take the third character and multiply it by p to the 2, and so forth. So, what you actually obtain is an integer number, and that is a hash value of your string. Of course, some strings can hash into the same value, and that is known as collision, but there, in practice we will not see a lot of them. So, let's see what we might have. For this particular dataset where we have three reviews, like good movie, not a good movie, or didn't like, uh, we take all the possible tokens that we have, and let's pass them through our hashing function phi. And uh, we take a pretty small b here, and... Um, what we actually can get is the following, like 0, 1, 2, 3, and 3. For A and D, we have the same hash value, but that is fine. And for like, we have the hash value of 4. So, how vectorization now works? And now, in our columns, instead of different tokens, we have different hash values. And those are uh, all the numbers from 0 to 4. And uh, let's see how our good movie now vectorizes. We look at the hash value of good, that is 0, and so we add 1 to the column corresponding to that value. Then we take the next word, which is movie, we hash it as well, we get the value of 1, so we input 1 in the column that corresponds to that hash value. And that is how we proceed with all the other uh, reviews that we have. And this actually looks pretty similar to bag of words, but now instead of tokens we have hash values. Okay, let's try to train a linear model on top of these features. Um, but first, let's look at this thing. Uh, now we actually uh, proposed a way how we can uh, squeeze the number of features that we originally had. So, in a bag of words manner, you had like 40 million features, and if you hash them, then you have 4 million features. And you can actually control the number of features that you have in the output uh, by adjusting that B parameter that you can find in the power of 2. And what that actually means is that now we can introduce a lot of tokens, a lot of features, like trillion features. And if we hash them, we still have the fixed number, uh, like 2 to the b, of features th that we can analyze. Let's see how it might work. So, phi0 is the old hashing trick that we used. We just take the hash value of our token and take that value modulo 2 to the b. Another thing is we can actually... Uh, we can use uh, personalized hashing. That means that we want to, uh, to have a feature that says that for that particular user U and that particular token, uh, if you see that user and that token in the email, that actually means that we want to learn some, some personalized preference of that user in uh, spam or not spam emails. And if you take a user, uh, add uh, underscore and token, and hash that new token, and take that value modulo to the 2 to the b, you have some new features. And actually, if you take in that data set, if you take all pairs of user and word, actually you have 16 trillion pairs. And it's not possible to look at those features as a bag of words representation. And because it takes like 16 terabytes of data, it's just not feasible. But if you take the hash of those features and take it modulo 2 to the b, you have a fixed number of features. So here we have our pipeline. We have a text document. We extract tokens. We add uh, personalized tokens where we just uh, add a prefix, let's say user123 underscore all the tokens that we've seen for that user. We hash all those tokens and we get some sparse vector of the size 2 to the b. Okay. Now let's see whether that hashing actually uh, hurts our performance or not. On this graph you can see uh, three different models. The first one is denoted with black color and that is baseline. That is actually the model that was trained on original tokens without any hashing, just in bag of words manner. We trained a linear model on top of bag of words. Uh, then the blue one is actually a hashed version uh, where you replace TF-IDF vectorizer with, let's say, hashing vectorizer. 
And now you have uh, a smaller number of features, and you can see that starting from some value of B, let's say 22, you, you actually don't lose anything in terms of quality. So if you take uh, B equally 18, then, then you lose some, uh, some quality. But if that value is huge, then that is okay. So it's pretty okay to use hashing if you have a lot of hash values. Uh, another thing is this red curve. Which, uh, which corresponds to personalized hashing. That is the model where, where you introduced personalized tokens and you hash them and uh, you use that for linear model as well. And you can see that that somehow gives you a significant boost in uh, miss rate. So actually on the y-axis we have a miss rate and we want to make it as low as possible. Okay, so Let's, let's understand why that personalized features actually work. Uh, so, the answer is pretty obvious, because they are personalized. They actually capture some local user-specific preference. Let's say some users might consider newsletters a spam, and that means that if you see some words that are frequently uh, used in newsletters, then for that particular user that would be a spam as well, uh, but for the rest of uh, the people, like for the majority of them, uh, those newsletters could be okay. So if you lose, if you, if you add that uh, personalized features, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, understand uh, what makes uh, a letter a spam letter for a particular user. But how will it work for new users? Let's look at, uh, at different users that have different number of emails in training. Let's say we take users that have 64 emails in training. That means that we have a very low miss rate for them because we, we know really well what is a spam letter for them and what is not. And if they have less and less examples, we actually, it actually starts to hurt the quality of the model because uh, we have less examples of what is a spam letter for them. But one surprising thing is that even for users that didn't have any uh, letters in the training set, we have a higher quality than a baseline model. And why does that happen? Because for those users, nothing changes. We don't add any user-specific tokens. And you, you, you can actually expect that nothing changes for them too, and we get pretty close to baseline, but actually we go... Uh, actually, it performs superior to baseline, and let's find out why. So, you can actually think of it as, um, as in, the, in the following way. It turns out that we learn better global preference when we have some features that correspond to personalized preference or local user preference. Let's take the same example uh, of people that hate newsletters. There could be a small number of those people, and for those people, we can actually use their personalized features to learn that those people hate newsletters. But for majority of the people, newsletters are fine. And that means that having those personalized features, linear models can learn then, okay, I will look at those personalized features, that particular person hates spam, okay, uh, hates uh, newsletters, uh, that is okay, but for all the rest I will use the features like uh, that contain the words that are seen in newsletters, like newsletter, and for those people, for all the rest, I will learn a better model. And that what actually happens in practice and that's how you can, um, how you can um, describe why this happens. Okay, uh, another thing is, why do we deal with such huge data set? Why do we take one terabyte of data? Why, why can't we take like a thousand of, of emails and just train our classifier? It turns out that you can learn but better models using the same simple linear classifier and the same simple features, but when you have more data, you can learn better classifier. And that can be well seen on ad click prediction. There is a paper on archive which has a proprietary data set as well, which has trillions of features, billions of training examples. And those people actually showed that if you sample your data set with, let's say you take a 1% sample or a 10% sample of a huge terabytes data set, then it actually hurts your model. It hurts your model in, in terms of uh, a, uh, area under rock curve. And you can see that it hurts it uh, with any sampling rate you take. 
And you may think that that uh, difference in the third uh, digit in uh, AUK actually makes sense. You may, you may think that, okay, that is not that much, why do I need to uh, bother with that one terabyte data set? But if you are talking about ad-click prediction, that means that any improvement in that ad-click prediction can actually lead to millions of dollars of revenue. So people actually, they actually want to squeeze the maximum uh, they can from those models. Okay. At last, I want to overview Vopal Webit library. That is a well-known machine learning library that is used for training linear models. It uses feature hashing that we have described previously internally. It has lots of different features and it's really fast and it scales very well. And what's more uh, uh, wonderful is that you can actually, uh, as, as an input to this uh, library, you can give your raw text and it will convert it, it will, it will uh, tokenize those, uh, tag, that, that text on white spaces, it will take the hash value from each token and it will use that hash values internally for hash vectorization. But you can also say that you want to pass your features there uh, when you already know the hash value and that's you can also do that you say like 13 column and some real valued number that means that in the column that corresponds to hash value 13 you will have those value okay let's summarize uh, we've taken a look on a different application particularly um, a spam filtering that uses feature hashing and thanks to hashing you can hash a lot of uh, uh, features like trillion features and you can actually add personalized features and that is a really nice trick to further um, boost the performance of your model. Linear models of a bag of words scale well for production, that is a well-known thing. And uh, that's, why, that's why we actually overview them, because most likely you will have to implement linear model as a baseline when you work somewhere in some corporation or anywhere else. In the next video, we will take a look at text classification problem using deep learning techniques.